All right. Thank you very much. Uh, it, is a, it is a great honor to, uh, uh, to be here uh, tonight. As I've told the kind of the faculty and the staff here, um, I spent some time uh, on campus the last couple years. My son actually almost came here um, as a baseball player, ended up not coming. You can talk to the coach, wherever Sam is. They took a different catcher the last second. But um, I, I love this school. I love this area. So it's, a, it's wonderful to be here. Um, an incredible kind of uh, opening from, uh, uh, from the Colonel. Not that he kind of listed the things I did um, in my career, and you know that's a lot of stuff in the past, but it's that he pronounced my name correctly. Um, and I, I always start these, these conversations, these, these uh, chats I have with a story from uh, 2006. I was our deputy station chief in Damascus, Syria. Um, that was a time before the Syrian civil war, and so it was, it was actually a, a place in which uh, you know, I could take my family. Um, but still, there was a kind of this critical uh, uh, kind of break in, in diplomatic relations between the U.S. and Syria. So really tense times, a lot of stuff going on. Similar to what's happening now in the Middle East in 2006, there was a war between Israel and Hezbollah. So we were always producing intelligence for policymakers. So one day I get a phone call on our green line. A green line um, for the agency was our secure line. And it was the president's daily briefers. They were going down to the White House. So I get on the phone. They said, Mark, we need your take on a situation. Now, ordinarily, there's a lot of layers that, that go into this. There's reviews. I can't just, you know, kind of send a note to the president. But they said, in this case, we're going down to see George W. Bush, and we need your take on this. So I was like, it's pretty cool. Um, and so I give my kind of analysis on the, on the whole situation. They said, wait by the secure line, because a couple hours from now, we're going to call you back. So I waited. Everyone went home from the embassy. I'm sitting there. I get a phone call on the green line. And they said, it's the team that's back um, uh, from the White House. I said, how'd it go? And they said, incredible session in the Oval with W. And I was like, OK, what did he think about my presentation? Like, what did he think about my analysis? This is really critical stuff for the US government. And they said, well, actually, it was a great about 10, 15, 20 minutes with W because we spent the whole time trying to pronounce your last name. So that's my joke that I start with uh, often. Um, uh, what we're going to do tonight, I'm going to take about you know, 30 minutes or so, talk about some leadership principles that I learned um, over my career. Uh, uh, they are applicable, not kind of for everyday life when things are going well. This is really for the periods of time, what we call the gray. Um, it, it's what I call clarity and crisis, the idea of, of leading with ambiguity. Um, and it does apply, uh, you know, perhaps not as you're sitting here tonight, but it applies to a lot of things in life, like what? Like what we just had with the kind of the epidemic. How did businesses, how did people get through COVID? Um, it, it, and it can apply to things like if you're a doctor or, or a nurse in an emergency room. It can it'll certainly apply if you're a, a cadet at VMI under a lot of pressure. So I'll give you some principles. I'll give you some things to think about. Um, but before that, I will tell you a little bit about my kind of journey. South Asia, 2011. We're on final approach to a CIA base. There are 20 Americans down below waiting for me, and the threat of indirect fire is real. It is midnight, it is pitch black, but I know the team below is a bunch of men and women, heroes who I will lead for the next year. There is no room for error. We're at the tip of the spear in the US government's fight against terrorism. As the helicopter finally lands, the only thing running through my mind is, am I ready to lead? My name is Mark Palomaropoulos, and I'm a 26-year veteran of the CIA who just retired a short while ago. Speaking in front of the camera, in front of large audiences, is definitely not the norm for me. My life for the last 26 years has been behind the shadows. But now, I have chosen to speak publicly about leadership, which has become a great passion of mine. Over time, and a great deal of trial and error, I have refined my leadership philosophy that I want to share with others. At first, it was applicable to the intelligence business, but it's certainly applicable to all walks of life. I call this philosophy finding clarity in the shadows. I will share nine core concepts for outstanding leadership and demonstrate to you how I employed them during my long career at CIA. Each principle builds on the last, and it's designed for real-world applicability, where you operate under time constraints and at times with a lack of situational awareness. I will help you embrace this ambiguity to learn how to lead with no fear. I will also give you what I call the Mad Minute Checklist, so you can take these principles and apply them directly to your career. There is no secret sauce here, just nine tried and true principles that I honed after 26 years of serving in some of the wildest places on the planet. I look forward to our time together. I certainly, I look at that video and I had a, I think we made it two or three years ago, I had a hell of a lot more hair back there. Um, 
All right, so just a little bit about me and my background. Colonel kind of gave you a, a little bit of, a, uh, of an overview. overview. I, I did seven operational tours. That means I, I was a CIA case officer. I was an operations officer. I'll tell you a little bit about that in a second. But that means I was posted uh, at US embassies overseas, or I was sent to conflict zones, places like Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan. So seven tours. I have a whole bunch of fancy kind of hardware, and I always make this joke. Um, maybe I can sort of make it to the cadets too. You, you know, you want to come back to, to my house in Northern Virginia in Vienna, I can take you down to the basement. We can have a bourbon. You guys can have a, I don't know, juice. You'll, you can have a bourbon too if you're old enough. But, and I, I can tell you all these great war stories. Um, but that's not what I'm here um, for today uh, because really a lot of the message that I'm going to put forward uh, uh, has to do with kind of things that really define what I think was really important as an intelligence officer, but it's overcoming adversity. It's, it's being humble, humility. So a lot of fancy hardware. Um, but not exactly what, uh, what I'm here to talk about. Uh, as the Colonel noted, I do a lot of stuff in the media. One of the, I call myself, we're not talking politics tonight at all. Um, that would kind of be a recipe for disaster. I call myself kind of a radical centrist. So as you see me up on uh, Morning Joe on MSNBC, then I'm there, I think I was the power player of the week on Fox, Middle Fox, then on CNN. So I basically, when I go out, I manage to kind of irritate everybody because I really, I just speak my mind. So. I think uh, probably a good place to be, but you'll see me on TV sometimes. Um, the other thing I do is some leadership talks like this uh, with the sports world. Um, I think that's St. John's baseball on the left. Who's that in the center? Who am I with? Ryan Zimmerman. Any, anyone here a baseball fan? Some baseball fans will talk a little baseball there. There you go. So um, that was a podcast I did with the International Spy Museum. Has anyone been there in DC? It's an amazing place. So, they still, the podcast is still up, and so Ryan and I for two and a half hours talked about the similarities and kind of counterintelligence practices between the CIA and the Nationals when they beat who in 2019? And what were the Astros doing? Cheating, there you go. Um, and then on the right, I'm there with uh, Kyle Schwarber. Uh, he's got a copy of my book. The funny point of that, I think I, I met Kyle. I said, hey, you want to copy this book? And he looked at it, and I said, hey, or smile. Someone took a picture, so it looks like you read it. That's what you got to do. Um, one of the things I, I also do, and I was mentioning to one of our guests here, the uh, chief of police here, is um, I do a lot of leadership consulting um, with police departments. And why is that? Because I think of CIA and, and, and the police as indispensable institutions, um, often get a lot of bad press, frankly. Um, you can debate you know, why or, or, or what's happened, but to me, these are indispensable institutions for the United States. You know, we have to have an intelligence service, we have to have police. Uh, uh, police departments, and so I've gone quite a bit, in fact, to Philadelphia. Um, and so if you look up online, I, I kind of wrote some articles, and I, when I talked about it in the media, um, you know, I thought I had a tough job at CIA, and then I visited uh, uh, the Philly PD. So I've had a, I've had a really rewarding time working, um, working with cops. Podcasts, they're all over the place. I think the cadets keep coming up to me talking about podcasts I did on Sean Ryan's show. That's me on Jack, uh, Jack Carr's show, Jack Carr, former SEAL. Um, uh, and that just kind of will give you more kind of a history of, uh, of my career. But again, what we're talking about today, clarity and crisis. Again, it's the notion of embracing less than ideal conditions. Like as a cadet, for you all in the front, do you want to be the one to raise your hand when times are tough? You know, what's the famous thing that we say, send me? You know, something's going down in Iraq, Afghanistan, places like that, we're putting teams together. Do you want to be the ones to raise your hand? Absolutely. And so kind of some of the principles are going to, are going to help that. And I'll tell you a whole bunch of kind of vignettes War stories, if you call it, from the world and special, uh, my world of, of intelligence special operations. But in each one of these principles, um, I'm also going to challenge, and I can, we have cadets here too, and the rest of the, the kind of the audience from the community uh, jump in too. Um, I'm going to challenge you, like how would you use these principles in your in your daily lives? Afghanistan, 2011. Um, I'm flying in to a paramilitary base on the Pak-Afghan border. It's 6,000 miles uh, away from home. Um, we're taking indirect fire. The helicopter's hovering, you know, a couple kilometers uh, from the base. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm, the, I'm a GS-15 at the time, equivalent of a colonel. I've been in the agency for a long time, but I'm still thinking to myself, like, what have I gotten myself into? You know, am I ready to lead 10 Americans and 1,000 Afghan indig indig indigenous forces? You all have heard about them, of course, from the withdrawal. Um, part about this, which was, uh, I always kind of uh, tell this story, is before I went, um, I had come back from a tour in which there was a terrible tragedy. December 30th, 2009, in coast Afghanistan, seven CI officers were killed. I was involved in that operation in, in, in a pretty significant way. I'll never forgive myself for that, and we'll talk about it uh, uh, in a second in terms of overcoming adversity. But one of the things I did is I came back from that tour, and I said, I got to go back to Afghanistan. I'd been there before. My wife asked me, where are you going to go? And I said, it's a small 
uh, uh, town in Pektika province along the Pak Afghan border. It's called Shkin. I said, don't worry about it. So what does anybody do? She Googles it and up pops Time Magazine, which says, it's the most dangerous place on earth. And that's an awesome dinner table conversation. A little bit about me, and, and this is again for, for some of the, the, the kind of cadets here who are thinking about careers. Obviously, you can graduate from VMI, go off to the private sector, get commissioned, go to the military, but there, you know, there's, there's a big world out there in terms of the intelligence community, and you know, everyone has this life journey. Um, so you know, how did I get to, to kind of CIA? Well, I was a middle class kid growing up uh, in New Jersey. My, you know, my dad never made more than, I don't know, $40,000 uh, in, in a year. Um, all right, for the cadets, who's that in the bottom right? You guys don't know. All right, the rest of the audience. Bruce, Bruce Springsteen, this is embarrassing. So Bruce, it's like, it's like a religious figure in New Jersey. Terrible. What do you get, demerits or whatever it is? You gotta go do something now. Um, the folks in the back know Bruce Springsteen, a legend. Um, but again, it was the notion, I grew up in, uh, in New Jersey, and it was the idea of wanting more. So what does that mean? So you know, I kinda had, a, I was, I was, my dad was Greek, my mom was American. We went, we traveled back to Greece sometimes. My dad, when I was 10 years old, um, he was a college professor at Rutgers. He had a sabbatical in a country called Algeria uh, in North Africa. And think about this, if your parents would do this and for the people in, in the back, think if you would have done this if you were kids. My mom, when I was 10, put me on an airplane at JFK airport, went through Paris by myself and I met my dad in Algeria and my dad and I traveled in that Volkswagen minibus like that 2,000 miles through the Sahara Desert. Um, that's a town, Gardez, uh, in, uh, in Algeria, um, sleeping in desert oases. I mean, I thought I was Lawrence of Arabia, so it's the idea of having these experiences when you're young, thinking, hey, you know, there's a big world out there, um, that I wanted something, something more. I went off to college, and then I joined uh, uh, CIA, which, of course, you see that's the Great Seal. You see that um, certainly in all the movies. Uh, bottom right, I always throw this up, Starbucks. Um, legend has it that it's one of the highest grossing Starbucks in the world. Kind of makes sense, and I think that some of the, the employees have to get security clearances, but uh, it makes sense because uh, people should be working hard. It should gross a, a lot of money, but there's something really important on this, uh, on this slogan on the left. When you walk into CIA headquarters, and I'll show you a slide in a second, and it's, on, it's about the memorial wall. There's stars in the wall. These are officers of ours who have been killed. That's a sacred, sacred place, but this, if you look to the left, is a line um, from the Bible. It's etched in marble, and it says, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. And that is kind of ingrained in every CIA officer because that's the idea of honesty and integrity, of telling the truth. Sound familiar for where we are right here? Um, ethics, integrity, honesty, absolutely critical. Now, some people will say, well, it's the CIA. You know, you're stealing stuff. I said, yeah, we're stealing it from foreigners, not from Americans. And so we have to be, tell the truth to each other. It's absolutely critical. So this certainly, what you all are practicing every day, um, really matters. A love affair, remember this word, um, and again, this is really for, a lot for, the, for the cadets here. Um, it's the idea of having a bond on a team that is incredibly strong, and I'm gonna give you a couple stories. Again, this is, uh, I, I mentioned before, the memorial wall. Um, helicopter from the border. Uh, when I was in Afghanistan, I got the words that, you know, a, a kind of a, a message no one wants, that my mom back in New Jersey had passed away. I was 6,000 miles away from home. Um, I'm on a frontline base where we, wouldn't, uh, we couldn't even get helicopters in most of the time. We have to get supplies airdropped because the weather was so bad. But a helicopter came in, picked me up, and I was have to, I'd have to hop bases for a while to finally get back to Kabul to then go to Bagram to then take a, take a jet back home. But we have these incredible helicopter pilots. They're veterans of kind of the most elite units of U.S. Uh, special operations, um, U.S. Army Task Force 160, incredible pilots. So they're veterans of Task Force 160. And we're hovering in this mountain pass, and the weather's terrible. They're trying to get me home, but I, I tell them, I, I'm on comms with them, I say, we gotta turn around. This doesn't make sense. And they said, no, we're gonna wait. We finally get to the next base. And I jumped and we got out of the helicopter and I said, you know, why'd y'all do that? Um, that was dangerous. Come on, this, is, this isn't an operational mission. Like we could have waited and they said, I was the boss, I was the base chief, said, no chief, we gotta tell you, you know, your mom passed away. We are getting you home, it's what we do. And I remember I had tears in my eyes. But that's the idea of love, the, the idea of, of Again, thinking everything I'm gonna talk about is how do small teams, how do you operate um, in times of, uh, of ambiguity, when times are tough? You gotta to have that bond. A Little bit about life as a, a CIA case officer. There's different things to do at CIA. You have analysts who produce intelligence for the president, for policymakers. They, it's all source, it's diplomatic cables, it's intercepts, signals intelligence, so how we're listening to communications, and then there's reports, and there's open source explosion now, and open source data, but then there's reports from spies, from agents. 
um, uh, you know, people that we recruit. And just one quick thing there. Um, I was an operations officer. There's no such thing as a CIA agent who's an American. An agent is a Russian, an Iranian, North Koreans. That's who, that's who we recruit. So when you hear late agents, not like the FBI. Um, what, I, what I tell folks, especially kind of, uh, you know, young students who want, are interested in the intelligence community, you know, what an incredible job that I had as an operations officer. You're serving overseas. You know, it's the, we are, I, was, I was having some conversations with cadets earlier. So we don't come home. We are deployed forward. You know, there's, there's, there is uh, the concept of defending forward. So, you know, 60% of my career of 26 years was posted overseas. So we're always uh, overseas. But what are we doing? You're witnessing her history. Sometimes you're making history. And let me just give you uh, a quick note about what an operations officer does. So our job is to spot assess, um, uh, develop, recruit, and then handle an agent. Again, it's a Russian, North Korean penetration of Hamas, you know, things in the news right now. Um, Chinese military officer, et cetera. Uh, but it's an incredible responsibility, honor to do this. Because what has this person done? So this person, someone who's chosen to spy for the United States government, um, in the past, of course, it was communism versus capitalism. That was during the Cold War. Now things are a little bit different. Maybe it's financial. Um, maybe that's things like, you know, we need to, we, or we have the ability as an American um, to send their kids to college, maybe to get medical care. But we're looking for vulnerabilities in individuals um, where they're going to spy for us. But in return, it's my job to keep them safe. So I tell the story about, you know, my life is in your hands. It's in, it's in the book. And this is a real story. And I've told this to, you know, hundreds of officers who I managed. We had recruited a diplomat from the Arab world. Um, I was training him on tradecraft. That's how to kind of operate um, securely, things called surveillance detection routes. So I'm, tra I'm, I'm training him on this in the streets of Europe. And he's nailing it. He's going to be really good. And he takes me aside one time. And I said, look, you're doing awesome. Like, we're going to go back inside. You know, we're going to do this. I'm going to keep you safe. We want him to work in place for a couple years. He's going to produce incredible intelligence for the US government. Um, and he said, OK, but I, I got to tell you something, Mark. And you know, you're going to think about me once a month. That's our meeting cycle. It's not a lot because it's a, it's a really dangerous area. We're only going to meet him once a month. He said, but I'm going to think about you every single day. And, and I said, well, why is that? And he said, because if you make one mistake, I'm going to die, my family's die, my, my whole tribe is going to die. So you have to be perfect. And then he said those famous words, my life is in your hands. And I had chills at that. And here I am, and how, how old was I? I was 26 years old. How old are you all? Right? Six, six, six years from now, you're going to have someone's life in your hands if you end up joining a place like the agency. Now you'll have tons of other responsibility in life. You join the military. Um, but this was really extraordinary to me, and it just gave, you, gave, gave me the sense, and I was able to pass on to others um, uh, the responsibility we have in helping those who are certainly helping the U.S. government. All right, we're going to jump into the leadership piece. Um, uh, I, I love this slide. These are not the principles. These are kind of some found foundations of, of leadership. But, um, and I've given this talk all over the country for the last couple of years. I was at Rickover Hall at the U.S. Naval Academy, and I put this slide up. And they, all, the, all the midshipmen started booing. Why is that? What, did I, what was I thinking? I should have put an, you know, Admiral Rickover. So I put up General Patton. But uh, a great leader, of course. But, so, the, so the question for you all, just to kind of think about, um, again, these are foundations. What is great leadership? So first of all, it's got to be what? It's got to be righteous in, in the sense of legal and moral. That's, that's got to be foundational. Um, number two, it's got to be di difficult. In my view, I'm not having this talk right now, if it's easy. Um, if it's easy, anyone can do it. It's got to be communicable. When you think about running teams, everybody's got to be on the same page. Any kind of leadership principles, everyone's got to be, everyone's got to know, or it's, it's not going to work. Um, and the last part is selfless. Don't ask others to do what you would not. And I love this slide right here. Right here. Anyone watch the World Cup last year? Soccer? Any soccer fans here? You did? What's that? that? So that's a locker room of the Japanese soccer team. Is that before or after the game? After the game. Isn't that incredible? That's after they played a game. So again, what does that mean? Selfless. They clean like that. And so when I, when I talk to sports teams, I, I talk to college particularly college baseball teams all the time, I said, that's got to be the locker after the game. That, to me, is leadership. All right, again, nine core principles. Um, you can succeed in less than ideal conditions uh, with no fear. One thing is I, didn't, you know, I don't have an MBA. Um, when I wrote the book, and I wrote the book because at the end of my career, it's really interesting, um, I was like, you know, I finally got it. I'm about, I'm about to retire after 26 years, and I'm finally a good leader because a lot of my career before, I was not, and I made a ton of mistakes. Um, and so everything is kind of learned from the streets of the third world, places like you know, Baghdad or, or Damascus or Cairo or, or Kandahar or Kabul. 
Um, and all the principles we'll talk about build on each other. First one, so I call the glue guy or, or the glue gal, and, and I love this. It's one of my favorite leadership principles, um, but it's the, the, it's, it's the idea of the power of contribution. And that means everyone matters. So again, think about what we're talking about. It's, it's leading in times of ambiguity, leading in kind of that gray area. So why is it really important um, uh, to understand the glue guy or the glue gal? But it's because it's the idea of the criticality of behind the scenes personnel. You know, everyone can't be a member of, you know, a, 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 uh, someone who's kind of assaulting a target um, and blowing down a door. Um, uh, for, as, same thing, a CI case officer, you know you, you know, you might be out collecting intelligence from an asset from an agent that's gonna change US policy, but aren't there people kind of behind the scenes that really matter? And um, you know, I, I was giving this talk one time to a, to a, a high school football team, um, quarterback there, going off to play division one, all state quarterback, and I looked at him, his name is playing at Yale now, his name is Rye Yates, I said, Rye, um, you know, who's your glue guys? And he, looked, and he looked over the table of offensive linemen and everyone cheers. So it's, I mean, it's, it's, it's a pretty easy principle to understand, um, but two things have to happen when you kind of lead small elite teams is one, you have to recognize this, identify these people, and then you gotta celebrate them. Um, we had at my high school, uh, I know we have one cadet here from the area, um, high school last year uh, in Vienna, Virginia, James Madison High School, we had the number 12, 12 pick in the Major League Baseball draft, Bryce Eldridge, throws 97 miles an hour, all state, $4 million signing bonus. I've talked to him about this and I've given this lecture to the team a, a million times, but when I sit with Bryce, I would say, who's your glue guy? Is it the starting catcher who's also playing in college? What do you think? No, it was the, it was the sophomore, maybe as a freshman, pulled up to, to, to varsity just to be his bullpen catcher, right? That, and that guy, by the way, was just as important to Bryce's success. He's an all-state player. For, I don't know if he gave any of the four million bucks to the backup catcher, probably not, but that's the notion. Um, I'll tell you a quick story from, and I'll, I'll kind of jump into some of the, the conflict zone stories. Uh, again, I was, I was a, a base chief uh, in Afghanistan, and so one of our jobs there, um, and it was, it was not building wells, it was not winning hearts and minds, it wasn't classic counterinsurgency, our job was to kind of go through the cycle of find, fix, and finish Al-Qaeda or the Taliban. That's what, our, that's what my job is, as a base chief to do. We were trying to find targets, um, we were, these were approved targets, and these were individuals who had killed Americans um, or were planning attacks on US military or planning attacks on the homeland. So a really, really uh, uh, incredible mission, and I'll tell a story later on about it. Um, but there's a lot of people behind the scenes, and I'll never forget one day, I got a call on the, on the radio net, um, and it was, uh, uh, it was from one of our local guard. He said it was a young Afghan boy who was walking uh, uh, around the base and stepped on old, unexploded ordnance from Soviet, when the Soviets invaded Afghanistan, blew his leg off. He was a 12-year-old kid, and he's dying. Two of my officers, um, again, nothing to do with our core mission. Two of my officers, one was a former Special Forces medic, the other was a former ER, doc, a ER nurse, I'm sorry, uh, in Baltimore. They ran out, um, and they're doing kind of emergency triage, and the kid's dying, but they save his life. And then they, and they, uh, the family comes from the local village, and I'm on the, kind of the radio net trying to get a U.S. Uh, Army you know, medevac helicopter in for an Afghan kid, basically begging and pleading, and we do. And as the, as the helicopter takes off, um, uh, and the kid and his family, and we know they're, we, at that point, at least, you know, my guys had said, hey, you know, the kid's gonna make it. I was thinking, this is incredible. Um, uh, by the way, no one's gonna write a cable, CI headquarters, no one's gonna even write it up. This, the, the rest of the world doesn't understand what happened, except that Afghan family, and as we're sitting around the fire pit that night, I remember getting emotional and saying that, hey, this might be one of the most impactful things that kind of we do when we're out here. Certainly, CI director's not gonna know about it. White House is not gonna know about it, but that's kind of a classic, classic glue guy, or glue gal. Uh, and so kind of the, uh, and this is a challenge maybe for, for you all, uh, for, the, for the cadets here is, um, think about this. Think about, you know, what, so think, what's the smallest unit you have right now? Is it your, your room, your company, something like that, right? Yes? So are there glue guys and glue gals? Are there people in there who, you know, perhaps they're not the, you know, the, the leaders of, of the company, but are, are they absolutely integral to the performance of your team? Yeah, so that's the kind of thing. So always think about that, and you want to celebrate them, um, and then when you also want to kind of go, through, go forward in planning with them as well. But that's a really important principle, because again, when the crap hits the fan, you're going to rely on these people. Number two, adversity is the PED to success. PED meaning performance-enhancing drug. Please don't go home and tell your parents that 
your former CIA guy came here, to, you know, advocating you taking steroids or something. No, but adversity is the PED to success. But it's the notion of you got to taste rock, taste rock bottom. Great teams, the elite teams that I led, that really operated in times of, of crisis and ambiguity, um, did that. That's your super fuel. You know, adversity is your super fuel. You have to understand that. Um, it's how you grow and lead. And again, you can't succeed in these less than ideal conditions if you haven't failed at first. So, any basketball fans here? Someone. What happened, Michael Jordan, sophomore year in high school? He got cut. Did he take a knee and go home? I don't think so, right? So it's, this adversity kind of hits everyone. It's the idea. Now, it's not failure, but it's understanding about what failing is. Uh, uh, is. And I'll, uh, any, any uh, Boston Red Sox fans here? All right. You went like this, sort of. All right, so you, we'll see if you're a true fan here. 2003, the Boston Red Sox were playing the, the New York Yankees in the American League Championship Series. Um, uh, series is tied 3-3. Famous Yankees uh, uh, kind of victory. Um, who hit the home run to beat the Red Sox four games to three in 2003? Aaron Boone. Otherwise, if you're a Red Sox fan, it's Aaron F. And Boone. All right, there you go, Aaron Boone. So the next year, 2004, same two teams in the ALCS, right? Red Sox are down 3 nothing. Red Sox Nation, this, this can't be happening again. We're dead. But Kevin Millar, who's a utility player, if you, anyone watched the MLB channel, he's on there all the time. Kevin Millar gets up there, and he does, as the classic blue guy smiles, he says, we're good. We're going to shock the world. We're going to come back and win, and everyone thinks he's crazy. But what happens? Red Sox come back and win four games to three. Unbelievable comeback. Historic. And as, as anyone, and I actually, I've, I, as I've talked to Kevin Millar about this personally, I, I've talked to members of the Red Sox. I said, how did you win? In 2004, they said, hey, what happened in 2003? That made us strong. We got it. We played loose. We're good. We're down 3-0 the next year. We're okay. What's the worst thing can happen? Aaron Boone getting in another home run against us. So it's the idea of kind of finding that power in the adversity. It's a little counterintuitive. Like, you don't want to fail, but great elite teams have been through really tough times. Um, you know, you know my, my example on this. Um, it spanned across 10 years. So uh, I went into Iraq. Late 2002, um, before the invasion, um, which was April, March, April 03. So late 02, I'm up in Iraq um, on a team in northern Afghanistan, living with the Kurds, um, and we're we're kind of recruiting agents uh, to provide order of battle information to the U.S. military. Um, it's it's a CIA team jointly with the 10th Group U.S. Special Forces, and and so we're collecting intelligence. We had a great Iraqi agent, um, and I was handling him. I was a, I was a junior case officer. I was handling him back home, Langley. Pentagon, everyone loved this. This is order of battle, really important stuff. You all know this. Uh, uh, but I pushed him too hard, um, or more so, there was pressure from headquarters, uh, and so I met him too frequently. Remember I told you back that, that story before about kind of being accountable, um, of being uh, uh, responsible for the life of an agent? Well, I pushed this agent too hard. He ended up getting caught, tortured, and killed. Um, and I never forgot that. It's on my conscience. I, mean, I still see him you know, in my sleep. That was a really bad moment for me. Let's fast forward 10 years. Um, again, I was, as I said before, I was a, I was a base chief uh, uh, in Afghanistan. When I arrived there, we had a target deck. And on that target deck was a Taliban member. Two things about this Taliban member, senior member. One is he was responsible for the death of two CIA officers a couple years earlier. Um, bad guy, but we can't kind of conduct operations based on revenge. Not allowed to legally, but he also was planning further attacks on US forces. So he was on our target deck, and over time, and over a lot of patients with huge pressure from headquarters, kind of thinking these same themes again, um, uh, when I was getting uh, a lot of kind of, uh, uh, not grief, but, but you know, people were saying, all right, let's, let's get going on this. But I took my time. I wasn't going to make, make the same mistake. We had recruited Pakistani agents in Pakistan who eventually put this bad guy in the X. Um, uh, and you know, I'll say it kind of antiseptically, you know, he was removed from the battlefield shortly after by our friends in the, in the US Air Force. Uh, with a Hellfire missile. And so sitting around that night, um, around a fire pit, we, we called, we used to say, we called it Caveman TV. There's nothing to do in Eastern Afghanistan. Um, so you're staring at the fire all the time. But we, I, I was really, really kind of thinking about this. I had about 60 messages from all over, the, uh, all over the world from other CIA officers who knew our two officers who had been killed before. But I was thinking about this, um, uh, and it was really incredible because I was thinking back that 10 years before where I had really screwed up in Iraq, and that was kind of the adversity. I learned how to be patient, um, how to run this operation correctly, and, and the, kind of the last part of the story is we grabbed a Thariah phone, a satellite phone, uh, and we called one of our officer's widows 
um, who's living in Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and we told her that we avenged the death of her husband. Really powerful moment. But again, the idea of adversity is the, is the PED to success. And so the kind of what I would challenge cadets, anyone in the audience, same thing. Um, identify a time when, when you failed. How did it feel? Um, this, all this stuff's in the book, but I just, you know, these are, these are kind of things for you to think about as kind of a mental checklist. The principle is important to understand, but you want to apply it to yourself. Um, and again, it's the idea of what did you learn from this uh, adversity? It's, a, it's a certainly a learning tool. Trust the process. Um, everyone hates the word process. Um, but think about what this means. In times uh, uh, of, of ambiguity, when the crap hits the fan, if you're leading a team, communications are down, um, you don't have situational awareness. You know, what you want to do is you want to have two or three, maybe four foundational things the team is really good at. Um, and, and we'll go over that in a second. Uh, it's the idea how you do anything is how you do everything. Um, I was joke, espionage is the second oldest profession. So what's the oldest? You all shouldn't know this. What's the oldest profession? Come on, prostitution. It's dumb. What an audience here. Come on. Um, uh, prostitution. But no, but, it, but again, it's the process is absolutely critical because every team has to do a couple things um, and, and do it flawlessly. Um, one quick note, you also have to be able to innovate along the way. I'm not talking, telling people not to, not to uh, kind of be creative. Um, but I'll give you a perfect example of this from my old world. We have to do something. I told you about running an agent. It's called a surveillance detection route. So if, I, if we recruit someone, we can't just go drive to their office in the Russian foreign ministry and meet them. You have to do something called, the, the acronym is SDR. And so that means I have to go you know, from point A to point B. But along that way, what happens? I have to maybe be in disguise. I have to take a lot of turns, see if someone's following me. I'm being pretty basic on this. Maybe I get dumped out of the backseat of a vehicle or of a trunk of a vehicle. Um, uh, maybe I have to hide in a park for several hours. But it's the idea of what we call getting black, meaning we can't have anyone following us because we have to keep that agent alive. And um, you know, one of the things, and, and by the way, this whole presentation, everything I'm talking uh, to you today has been cleared by CIA, so I'm not telling you any secrets. Uh, but they don't like to tell me all the, you know, they, they say, hey, when you tell a story like this, um, uh, try not to tell exactly where you were located. I, of course, probably violated that a couple times. But I say, so I, I'm going to tell you today, I wasn't in the country, or maybe I was in the top right. That's the way I get around this. Um, or, or what that is right there. And so obviously, this is in an Arab capital. There's tons of traffic. I have to go out to an agent meeting. It's a critical meeting. Um, again, headquarters, there's, I think at the time, there was a meeting with our Secretary of State. We had a, uh, an agent who was going to give us the talking points of our, his counterpart. Really important for US foreign policy. So I go off. I have all my timing hacks. I have places I'm going to stop to see if people are following me, get in disguise, this and that. But traffic is jammed up. And I'm, I'm, I'm losing kind of the whole surveillance detection route. I'm losing the timing hacks. And at one point, I realize I can't do this correctly. And so what I do is I, I abort the meeting. I say, I can't, I can't do it. Well, why is that? Ethically, I can't put an, an agent's life at risk. So I come back um, uh, to the CIA station. And the station chief says, all right, Mark, get cracking. Washington's been calling already. You got to write up the intel. And I said, couldn't make the meeting. Why? I said, well, that, that process piece is critical. Keeping the agent, I couldn't do it. Now we have a fallback. 24 hours, 36 hours, whatever it was, was fine. But the reaction of my station chief, because he got it, is like, OK, no problem. Because that process is absolutely critical. And that's something that, um, uh, uh, again, uh, you, you cheat, someone, someone may die. And so think about this in, in daily lives. When I talk to, um, again, this is, this is kind of simple. If I talk to uh, a group of police officers, I say, all right, what, what, are, what are two things you have to do? Um, and, so, and so it's the process stuff. People don't really like this, but it's what? If, if, you, if you stop and you arrest someone, what do you got to do as a cop? Read them their rights. What if you don't do that? The case gets screwed up. So again, you're thinking about these critical things. I, you know, I think about when I go talk to a college baseball team. Um, what does a pitcher have to do? Throw what? Bullpens, right? If you're a hitter, you got to hit every day? Pete Rose hit every day. Yeah, and the answer is yes. So it, there, there are a couple things. And when, you, and, and when I talk to, for, for example, for a baseball team, I would tell someone, look, um, you know, you might fail in situations down the line, but if you're up, bottom of the ninth inning, three to two, uh, you know, you're down three two, and you're up. You're the one who's you're you're, you're pinch hit, hitting, and you're going up there, and your heart's beating. But you know what? This is what you're going to tell yourself: I hit every day. I went to the weight room every day. You know, I never missed a lifting session. I did all these things. So then there's a common you saying, look, whatever happens, happens. But I prepared myself. I've trusted this process. Um, so to me, that's a really powerful uh, way to get through ambiguity. Next, <clears throat> humility is best served warm. For me, uh, uh, the most important trait of an intel officer 
was being humble. And that sounds a little counterintuitive. CIA, and I always joke, I've, I've been talking to kind of the faculty here today. Um, it, CIA, when they recruit for the operations officer cadre, it's actually kind of disturbing. They, you know, the personality traits is like a sociopathic narcissist. That sounds kind of terrible, and it is. But you're, you're, but you're still on the side of the law, so you're not that um, uh, kind of off the, uh, uh, off the charts on this. But, and that's fine because your job is to operate alone. You have to make decisions by yourself. Um, but ultimately, you still have to have that one trait, and you learn it very quickly, and that's being, being humble. And I think that's really important. Again, great leaders own mistakes and learn. Poor leaders scapegoat and deflect. We see this all the time. Look at our political system on both sides of the aisle. Um, I'll tell you a quick story about, um, again, when I had kind of a notion of humility, what I learned from this. Um, and again, it's the idea, all this is putting into perspective how to lead small elite teams in times of crisis. But for me, I was running an operational unit out of our headquarters uh, that at the time, um, there was uh, a, a, an offshoot of Al-Qaeda called Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, um, located in Yemen, Saudi Arabia. And their, their job, their, I mean, their, their task, the terrorist group's task, they wanted to blow up US airliners. They wanted to blow up US embassies, and our job was to stop them. And, and it, was a, it was an incredibly important job. And I ran an operational unit where I was going down to the White House all the time, I was briefing the National Security Council, you know, the, the president and everyone, they didn't know my name, but, but they knew our unit and we were just, we were kicking butt. Um, and we're getting praise all the time because we're removing terrorists in the battlefield who are gonna kill Americans, kill people like yourselves, friends and family. Um, and then one day we made a mistake and we incurred what's called on there, it's CIVCAS, civilian casualties. So we hurt some people we shouldn't have. Uh, and all of a sudden, the same White House was really pissed at us. And I got called up to the, the seventh floor of CIA headquarters. Um, and it's the CIA director, the deputy director, I think maybe it was the acting director at the time, but you know, 40 of his and you know, his closest friends, uh, the leadership of the agency, and I went up there and I had to explain what happened. But I remember doing something very consciously. Uh, again, this is, this is as, as a leader, I got, I got much better at this at the end of my career, but I went up um, and I said, look, let me just tell you something. You know, I, I, the operational unit I ran, we had, a, we had a billion dollar budget and I had 200 people working for me, but I said, it's my fault. Now, of course, I, I, at that point, you know, I, I knew officers who worked for me, who made those mistakes, this didn't matter. It's my fault, I take full responsibility, it's on me. Any sanction on this is on mine. And let me tell you, sir, um, these are the three things that happened. So we've identified what happened, and we, these are, next to these are three things, we fixed it already. That's it, it's been fixed, it will not happen again. And I said, any questions? And they're getting heat from the White House, um, they're looking at me, they're pissed, and it's all silent. And I walk out of that room, and I'm walking away, and the Deputy Director of Operations, that's the Chief Spy at, at CIA, comes up to me and I said, Hey, I get it. You want to remove me? I understand. I, you, know, you know, we screwed this up. He said, no. He said, you're fine. And I said, well, it's not fine. You know, they didn't ask any questions. And he said, exactly. Because you owned it. You told them what went wrong. And you told them what you're going to do to fix it. You told them how you fixed it already. And so you took kind of full responsibility and accountability. And that's the notion. There's a little bit of humility in that, too. Um, that bought me, of course, obviously, I kept my job. And I went down to my team. And they said, what happened? And I told them exactly what happened. So now all of a sudden, of course, I have buy-in from them too, because, hey, their boss kind of took the bullet. Um, now, we made changes. You know, some people made some mistakes. But again, it's the idea of, of humility. And, what, and, and again, for me, it was the notion of I ran this incredible unit. I was walking like a badass every day, walking through CIA headquarters thinking we're saving the world. But you know what? The next day, we screwed up. Um, and it's, it's, so it's that, also that notion of understanding. And some of the jobs that you do, and you all will have this um, in your careers, um, there's a fine line. And so you can have that sense of you know, confidence, but having that sense of humility, super important. Next, principle of winning an Oscar. It's the idea of there's no day off as a leader um, uh, uh, ever. This is, a, this is an interesting concept because uh, a lot of people don't understand this, is that you, know, you are on display all the time. Um, as a leader, people are looking to you. Now, you all probably see this from your, you know, your, your time in the, in the barracks. But, um, but ultimately, uh, uh, all eyes are, are on you, no matter what. Um, I think, of, and, so, and so you have to do a couple things. You have to kind of be conscious of how you're acting. You also have to be authentic, and I'll kind of give you some examples of this. September 11th, 2006, I was at a U.S. Embassy in the Middle East, um, getting a cup of coffee, and all of a sudden, uh, I hear what sounds like automatic weapons fire. Sounds a little strange. Um, and then you hear explosions on a roof, and these are grenades being tossed. Al-Qaeda is attacking our embassy. Um, I run into, I was the deputy station chief. I run into the station chief. Um, you know, uh, and then I hear over the, over the, the one MC, the, uh, the, uh, the communication system at the embassy, um, the Marines kind of hit the panic button, 
um, and then scream we're under attack and the alarm's going off and then everything cuts out and we're like, oh crap, this is real. Now we knew the embassy had been under threat so we, were, we had drilled, we were, we were prepared for this. Um, but the station chief, uh, you know, so him and I look at each other, he was a, he's, he was a you know, we had been together in Iraq um, uh, several years earlier, he's a former SEAL so he, he got it. Um, but, but afterwards we were both kind of talking about it. I was like, his name's Tom, I said, Tom man, I was like, I was pretty scared. He's like, so was I. And I said, well let me tell you, I was really scared. And he said, so was I. Um, that's okay. Um, it's, it's natural. It's authentic. Um, he writes a cable. It's called a critic cable to the rest of the, the stations, the embassies uh, in the region, thinking like, okay, maybe it's, a, maybe it's kind of a, a concerted attack. Um, and I have to go, and I, and I open up our weapons safe to, to, to break out the weapons locker because what happens over the, over the, uh, the communication system is that now Al-Qaeda has breached the embassy. They're on the embassy grounds. Turns out not to be true. And now we're really getting worried. And so I have to, you know, if you, if you Anyone's had uh, uh, experience with safes before, you're kind of spinning left, right, left, and I'm, my hand's shaking. I'm, somehow I got it open. And I passed out the weapons. We had body armor. I passed out body armor. The entire station is looking at me. I'm, I go back in the bullpen. Everyone's there with their eyes kind of bugged out. What do we do? And so I, you know, we, we, I passed out the body armor. I passed out the weapons. They were covering different areas uh, of the station. But I said something to them, and this is not, I'm not bragging about this at all. Um, uh, because later on we did a full after action, but I said something to them. I, I didn't say everything's going to be fine. That would be lying. But I said to them, I said, we've prepared for this moment, and, and Tom, Boss and I are going to do everything possible to get you home to your families. Uh, and it turns out later on that, you know, in the feedback, that was really important because, I, again, I didn't say um, everything's fine. It's not. There's grenades hitting our roof. At the end of the day, a uh, car bomb hit the back gate, didn't go off. Security forces killed the attackers in the front, so we lived, uh, lived to kind of tell about, uh, tell about you know, the story right here today. Um, uh, pretty extraordinary. And then going back to again, my life as, a, as an operations officer, the strange thing is my kids were at an uh, international a diplomatic school a mile away, saw the embassy burning, thought my wife and I were dead. Still to this day, they're in college. You know, they're, they were still traumatized. This happened a, a long time ago. I go home. We order a pizza. A little weird. We're sitting around having a pizza. Well, how was your day? Well, I don't know. The embassy was attacked. And then uh, their trauma, they're, they're still really emotional. My kids were, what, they were four and six. Um, put them to bed, and then I went out that night. I had to go meet an agent to find out what the hell happened. Kind of, that's, that's uh, we were talking about before, life is a, 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 of a CIA case officer. Um, but again, it's the idea that everyone's looking at you all the time. That's uh, that picture of the mess hall. That's a picture of me in Afghanistan. The picture of the mess hall, same kind of thing in Afghanistan. I go out um, on patrol. Uh, with, uh, with the officers. I was the base chief, so I went out every once in a while with our paramilitary officers, so we're out on patrol. Um, I come back, 36-hour patrol, haven't eaten, haven't slept, I'm hungry. We'd stopped at a forward base, I'd gotten bed bugs, it was nasty. I was miserable. Ordinarily, you can see, I'm a really outgoing guy, and I would talk to them all the time about their lives and everything like that. Um, the officers who were working for me at the time were veterans, uh, U.S. military veterans who joined the agency. A couple of them had been in, in, in Mogadishu. Um, uh, during the kind of the, the famous incident of Black Hawk Down, some were former SEALs. They were really tough individuals. And so when I came back from that patrol, I went and I sat by myself for the first time. Usually I'd sit with them, and it was like I was in high school. They were like, Mark's mad at us, and I was getting annoyed. And then later on, as I reflected on this, what did I, what did I do wrong? I didn't tell them, I'm tired. I'm going to go kind of sit by myself. Um, again, it's the notion you're always on display, really important. Um, and so... Again, for, for everyone in the audience, you know, particularly the cadets, think about that time. Think, you know, so in your, in your VMI career, are there times when you're exhausted? When you're cranky, everyone's nodding, right? Um, maybe you didn't portray yourself as, as a leader that you'd like to. That's okay, you're human, but just understand as leaders, always on display. Um, and again, why am I talking about this? When times are tough, people are looking at you. Family values, go through this quickly. I, I, I love this slide because it's a, my mentor on here, um, it's the notion if you want your men and women to follow you into the fire, they have to believe in, in you and each other. You know, elite teams, resilient teams that operate really well in times uh, of crisis have this incredible bond. Um, that's Charlie Seidel on the left. He's, he's passed away now, sadly. Um, that's us uh, in, uh, in Baghdad in March, April, April 2003, when we first went into the city. Charlie was an incredible station chief, an incredible Arabist. He spent his whole career in the Middle East, um, spoke perfect, you know, beautiful, fluent Arabic, but had the notion of building strong teams. And so after this time, it had been, been six months um, uh, uh, in Iraq, when I came back, 
I didn't realize this and all the kind of the stuff we were doing. Um, uh, I was having terrible nightmares. Clearly, I had a, I had a case of, of, of PTS, post-traumatic stress, but I didn't, obviously, one of the terrible things that happens is, you know, you have this denial. So I was saying I didn't have this. I was wake up in the middle of the night. I was in terrible nightmares of kind of dead bodies and really bad stuff. My wife was terrified. Um, she thought I was going to hurt myself. And so she calls, and, I, you know, she was begging me to go to the doctor, and I refused to do it. Um, I was worried about what, getting taken off kind of future deployment status, but she calls Charlie, um, and Charlie had a, had a cottage in Cape Cod. We were all home on R&R &R for a long time, and he had a cottage in Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and he's like, and she said, Mark's not doing well. He goes, I got this. So she, he got the original team of ours from Baghdad. It's amazing. Um, 20 of us and all of our families, he, and he said he rented cottages up in Cape Cod for 20 of us, and we went up there for two weeks just to bring the team back together. And I get chills talking about it because Charlie personifies that family values, and that's what he did for me. And, and I really started healing um, because of Charlie and, and, and how he kind of how he believed in us. And so um, it's just that notion of of, uh, of taking care of your people and having that strong bond. You know, talking to to cadets at VMI, I think this is probably pretty self-evident. I mean, you think about um, you know uh, uh, your 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 rat here, the the roommates you have are those your roommates for life. You said no. <laughs> Some people are saying yes. Do you, have a, do you have a close bond with people, with other cadets that you've gone through some really tough times? I think the answer is probably, probably yes. Number seven, be a people developer. It's the idea of mentorship. This one um, uh, I, I love uh, because it actually, at the end of my career, my last job at CIA, I was the chief operations for the Europe and Eurasia Mission Center. That's 50 countries, or 40 countries, 44 countries, 2,000 people. Um, uh, I was promoted to the senior intelligence service, rose up the ranks, the equivalent of a four-star general. And I hated every part of it because it was all people, problems, it's problems, resources, budget, nothing to do with operations. And so I was, I was pretty consistently miserable at the end of my career, which is not, you know, uh, something all that different when you rise up in the ranks. But what did I really love doing? So I started actually having mentoring sessions. I started meeting all the young officers, the case officers coming into CIA. And I realized that's how I'm going to be remembered. And that's really important. How will you be remembered? How, how do you want to be remembered? But it's the notion of passing the torch to the next generation. I, that's, what, that's actually why I love doing this. I love coming and talking uh, uh, to groups. I love seeing you know, young patriotic Americans who are interested in national security. We are passing the torch uh, to you. Um, you know, my time is long gone. It's, it's time for you all. Um, there's a story I, I, I love telling about uh, acting chiefs in Afghanistan. One of the things I used to do, again, in, in mentorship, it's the idea of passing the torch, getting people ready. Well, in building elite teams that can operate in times of the gray, one of the things I learned uh, uh, early on is that I actually have some control. So when I was a base chief, um, and it was in Iraq and Afghanistan, what I do is sometimes I, if I'm in a certain area of a country, I have to travel through that country. So I would very informally, I wouldn't even tell anyone about it, um, I would talk, tell, you know, I'd have five case officers. And each time I go away for two or three days, each one of them gets to be what? An acting chief. For example, in Afghanistan, what did that mean? It means we're taking incoming fire. You've got to return fire. It means we have agent meetings. We're, we're going to come give us locational information on high-value targets. You might have to call in airstrikes or work with our military partners. Really huge responsibility. And I remember jumping on a helicopter one time, leaving, and one of the officers, I, and he turned out, and this is great because he turned out to be a really great station chief, and he's senior now. But he came, comes up to me, and he said, hey, boss, I'm going to hold down the fort for you. And I said, what? He said, I'm going to hold down the fort. And what I did, I can't encourage, but I remember I grabbed him by his, by his shirt and I said, what are you talking about? I said, you make every decision when I'm gone. We'll go over it when I get back, but I want you to make every single decision because that's how you're going to learn. And he looked at me with these big eyes and he did. Um, but that's the idea of giving people these kind of mentoring developmental opportunities because what happens um, if you're running a team and, and you're the boss and communications are out or maybe you're hurt, maybe you're incapacitated. You want to have trained all those junior officers, even informally, um, to take over when times are tough. And so uh, that's something that I, that I really believed in. For, for kind of, again, for the, for the cadets here, it's the idea of mentorship. And what, when, I, when I talk to sports teams, I, I would go talk to, I was down in uh, Lafayette, Louisiana, um, talking to their, their baseball team, an amazing coach there, Matt Deggs. And you know, they send players to the major leagues all the time. And they had a senior. Um, well, I was talking to the whole team in the locker room, and I said, who, you know, who's your leading hitter last year? And he said, someone raised their hand, I was. I, and I said, what was your average? And he understood what I was going to. He goes, doesn't matter. I said, you're right. Well, his average was 340. He was going to get drafted by the major leagues. And I said, what matters right, right now to you as a senior? 
And he said, I got to pass the torch to the freshman. I got to leave this place better, finding it, you know, better than, than how I found it. That's what you want in terms of mentorship. Employ the dagger. One more to go. Um, employ the dagger. This is the, I, I love, you know, and, and remember the old movie Wall Street, what was the famous line? Greed is good. That's not what I'm saying here. But, but it's the, the, with the employ the dagger principle is the idea is competition is good. Competition is healthy. And, th and that's sometimes people have a hard time understanding that. Um, you know, my, my son who's playing college baseball, he's fighting for a left field spot right now. He called me the other day. And I said, you know, how you, how'd you do? He said, practice was fine. I said, you know, how, I, of course, I, I'm curious. I said, how's the, how'd the guy do who you're competing with? He goes, he hit a home run. And I said, what do you think about that? He said, good. It's going to push me to get better. That's perfect. So competition is healthy. The, the um, picture there is uh, Virginia Tech baseball. They have this kind of giant sledgehammer. What does that mean? So when I say employ the dagger, what, what, some of the things I would do in terms of encouraging my teammates, my team to get better, is I'd come up with these kind of strange uh, uh, reward systems. In the Middle East, it was a dagger. I'd run out to the local, you know, the market, the souk. I'd buy a $10 dagger. I would give that to any member of the team who did something really special. It's not a, it's not a promotion, not an exceptional, it's not a performance award, but you know what? You recruited someone, you collected a good piece of intelligence, you have this dagger right now. And what happens after that? All the case officers, all the operations officers are competing for this. It doesn't mean anything, but it just, it fostered that sense of competition. Um, and that's what I kind of, uh, that's one of the things I learned is that, hey, this, you know, everyone's going to rise to the top. Competition is healthy. You can promote this. And by doing this, uh, you know, later on when you're, uh, you know, kind of when your team's jammed up, um, uh, everyone will have gotten much better. One quick thing, I, you know, I, when I talk to some companies, I talk about right here, it's called the stand-up morning meeting. And that to me was really effective um, as, a, as a case officer or as a manager of case officers. So instead of telling them what they would do, or, you know, what they would have to do, I'd say, hey, so CI officers, you've got to work at night. You got to go out there. You got to try to meet Russians or Iranians on the diplomatic circuit. Maybe you're um, conducting agent meeting. Maybe you're performing counter surveillance for colleagues. But you're working at night. So I go around everyone once a week. What'd you do last week? <clears throat> There's six, seven case officers in the station. Um, five of them told me their, you know, what they did. But the, one of them's like, I, I didn't go out. And you kind of, you kind of start doing that uh, round and round. And what does that do? Do I have to actually say anything? No. It's actually peer pressure. Um, that pushes everybody uh, to get better. And it's something that I, that I noted, uh, I think, in a previous slide about standards versus rules. And it's great teams, great elite teams, don't have rules. They have standards um, that everyone understands. So it's the idea of, of employing the dagger. That really that, that helped me in, uh, in my career. Final piece, I'm just going to tell a story. It's putting all these principles together. That's why I call this finding clarity in the shadows. And, um, and so if you think about it, and you know, so the, uh, we talked about eight principles. Um, this ninth one is putting it all together. But you talk about eight principles. So what I want you all to do as you walk away, you're going to remember. You buy the book, you'll have all of them. But if you, if you're, you remember two or three, that's what's really important. Um, that's kind of what people have the capacity to understand and, and, and to learn. Um, but here's where it all came together. So I had left Afghanistan. Um, I was back at CIA headquarters. Uh, I had uh, a different job, but I was called um, by our kind of an operations floor saying that, hey. The senior most Taliban figure, your team, has on the X, but we have a problem. And I, so I went down to kind of the operations floor, and I said, what's going on? And they said, we've lost communication. I said, OK. Um, they want to launch an operation to capture this guy, or maybe something more. But we have, you know, we have no ISR up. We can't see anything. We have no comms. We don't know what's going on, so we're not going to give approval. And I said, why? Um, and they said, because you know, we've lost situational awareness. And I said, well, hold on a second. Because um, I, I said, let me just tell you about the team. Um, they'd gone through a lot of adversity. I'd given them tons of um, uh, mentorship opportunities. You know, they had true glue guys and glue gals. I'm rattling off all these principles while I think we're, gonna, we're just fine. Headquarters is like, we don't know what's going on. And so a senior officer came down and he said, look, um, what do you think? And I said, I think we should do it. And he said, it's your fault if this goes badly. I'm like, I don't even work here anymore. Uh, but, it, but I said, fine. You know, I, sir, again, accountability, I'll, I'll take it. And the operation was successful because they employed uh, uh, all these principles. That's, so that's something, kind of a real world scenario um, to throw out there. That's a picture of me. I love uh, kind of ending on, on, on a couple of these. Well, first of all, on the right, um, that's, uh, that's our uh, MI-17 uh, helicopter uh, call sign jawbreaker um, that went into Afghanistan. I think you had some, um, some speakers, former colleagues of mine in here last year who were on that helicopter. Um, in fact, Two VM, well, at least one, maybe two VMI grads as well. 
Um, but that's a legendary uh, uh, you know, uh, piece of machinery that sits at CIA headquarters. This is a picture of me um, in eastern Afghanistan. A couple of things about the picture that, that I, well, I, well, I love kind of showing audiences. Um, first, on a, on a sad note, um, actually next to me, I, I had to kind of take it out, was our Afghan indigenous commander who was killed the next day. We were clearing a cave complex, but the next day he was killed. Again, and this is just, I, I, I kind of put this forth to audiences to, to kind of remind everybody, it's out of the news a little bit, about our Afghan allies and partners. Um, I wouldn't be here today without them. I ran a base with about 10, 15 Americans, 1,000 Afghan Indig, and you've heard all the stories of us um, tragically leaving some of them behind. So uh, I'll never forget that guy. But one funny part of this story, so you know, you look at that, I maybe you think it looked kind of cool or whatever, but the real story of this is in the, in the team house in Afghanistan, um, my, again, you know you have a really tight-knit unit. On the bottom, someone had kind of written in a little Sharpie pen, Bin Laden chef. Because my head is so damn big, the pakol looked ridiculous on me, so they're making fun of me. That's when you know you've got a great team. Um, last piece, or uh, uh, one last uh, uh, kind of story, and then I'm going to uh, end on some wellness and resiliency issues. But this, I, I love telling a story about Darren Labonte. Um, Darren Labonte was killed December 30th, 2009, in coast Afghanistan, again, in a, in a tragic operation um, that I was involved in. He worked for me. Um, Darren was an amazing guy. Uh, he, uh, he was a baseball player in Connecticut. Um, was going to be drafted by the Cleveland Indians, decided to join the Army, um, went to the Army, became a Ranger. When he left, he then decided to uh, become a cop. From there, he joined the FBI, and he finally made his way to CIA. You know, I, would kind of, I would joke them, like, you can't really hold down a job. But he was really kind of this incredible kind of Superman figure for us. Um, that's his grave in, uh, in Arlington National Cemetery. It's a Madison High School baseball hat. The Madison High School baseball team would go um, uh, to his grave each year. But the amazing thing is uh, his mom, and his parents still alive in Florida, his mom gave me his high school baseball card. Um, that's it in the left. Uh, he was a catcher, as is my son, and my son still carries that in his baseball bag now as he's playing uh, baseball in college. But it's, it's just a notion that there are some really incredible Americans out there. Last piece. A good buddy of mine. I had this slide just in the end. A um, good buddy of mine is named Rob Lively. He was the former command sergeant major of, of Delta. Uh, uh, Delta Force, which is U.S. Army's most elite special operations um, uh, element. But one of the things he, we, him and I have talked about over the years is, is kind of how to take care of yourself. And this goes very much alongside, I'm talking about leading elite teams, leadership on this. But you know what? You got to take care of yourself as well. And so he calls it the combat leadership chassis, and I love this. Um, and this is, I teach this to police departments all the time, particularly, you know, uh, special tactics units, SWAT units, or others um, who have some high-stress jobs. But it's, you know, what do you do? So this is just kind of hints for people. You wake up in the morning, um, and you have to, uh, the mindset is you control what you can control. There's variables out there. So many things that are going to happen, but there's some things that you can do. So what do you do to keep yourself healthy? Keep yourself ready for when crisis situations hit. Hydrate. Drink water. Any of the cadets here play, uh, play uh, on, on, on an athletic team? There you go. Is hydration important? Critical, right? Uh, water. Nutrition. What you put in your body. Same kind of thing. Exercise. Again, one of the things that when we we're in conflict zones, we always kind of stress, you know, even if we're, we're working 18 hours a day, got to hit the gym. Exercise is huge. There's things that I have become much more attuned to, you know, in my older, older years, um, that I realize that high performance athletes are doing, such as meditation, yoga, deep breathing. These things really work. Um, journaling. This is, this is now almost accepted. I, when I go and I talk to police departments, I say, you know, cops who are, or, you know, an, an inner city cop who's coming home every day, if you start doing things like journaling, that's going to uh, uh, help you tremendously in, in terms of non mental health. And the last is what you call the kind of the 1424 principle. That's 14 minutes out of 24 hours. That's 1% uh, that's of 24 hours. What I'm asking everybody to do when I go talk to teams is that's the time you take for yourself to do something. Get some kind of workout in, some kind of exercise, some kind of meditation. Um, uh, it's 1% of your 24 hours, you can do that. But this combat leadership chassis is what absolutely saves so many officers in high stress situations because you're taking care of your body. On that note, um, that's kind of my, my presentation on leadership. Again, not from an MBA, um, it's from kind of tried and true uh, uh, hard times uh, in the third world. And, and I will tell you, as I've gone around the country the last couple of years, um, one, of the, one of the coolest things is I'll give this presentation to a special operations element, a class like this, and I've, I've even given it to kind of a, a class of librarians. I've given it to kind of teachers associations because ultimately it's just being able to take care of yourself when times are tough. And 
that's kind of, that's what life's all about. Uh, thank you all very much. I'm happy to take any questions before we do some, some book signing. Any questions? Okay. Oh God, the Vienna Inn. Anyone here from Northern Virginia? Anyone been to Vienna, the Vienna Inn? There you go. So the Vienna Inn is a legendary um, uh, kind of dive bar. It's been around, God, since 1960. It's a huge CIA hangout. And, that, and, and for me, that's the place where, you know, when we come back from, you know, like a deployment in Afghanistan, um, uh, you, you kind of gather. It's where people have promotion parties. Um, it's part of that, that notion of kind of family values. That's, I don't know, if you saw Cheers, that's, you know, um, and one of the neat things, but the, if you go in there now, you know, I'm probably in there way too much. Um, they, there's a hat uh, on the wall right by, right by the men's room, but it's in a glass case, and it's a Vienna and baseball hat I wore for that year uh, in, in Afghanistan. And, and, and the owner is, is, is absolutely supportive uh, of the intelligence community. There's a lot of the staff there whose relatives, you know, husbands, wives, um, uh, work at the agency. But it's one of those places that, uh, that has uh, been very important to a lot of us um, over the years. So. And, and, of course, they're legendary for Philly cheese dogs. So, so. Oh, sorry. So one question I have was, um, if you could elaborate on how you came up with the topic. Yeah. Um, I know you said you talked about that a lot. Right. Um, sure. So you know, to, just like anything else, you know, I, I, when you kind of look at, at your kind of leadership philosophy, I got that from Tim Corbin, who's the head baseball coach at Vanderbilt University. Um, and what does standards versus rules means? It means that as a coach, you put forth rules. Um, but as the leadership of the team, the team captains, there are standards. And what does that mean? That means that when you get off the bus, um, and, and Tim Corbin would say this when I, when I, I gave a, uh, a, a talk with him at a, at a special operations unit one time. He said, when I get off the bus, when we're getting off the bus and I see the other team, how they're dressed, I know if we're going to win or lose. The standards of how they're getting, is their uniform tucked in right? Are they wearing the right thing? Is their hat? On correctly. That's a standard. Another standard is, you know, morning lifts. Is everyone showing up? Um, but the standards are set by the leaders of the team, not by the, it's not a rule that the coaches make. And I actually love that. And that's, when you get to a place where there's standards like that, um, it can be an absolute magical thing. Because then every, it's almost, you know, it's peer pressure. Everyone's policing each other. It's not the rule set by, by the coach. Sure. There was. <laughs> So the, the one, the brand new one. So there's, you know, so, so there's, so if the CI Museum existed for a long time and only in the last year or year, two years maybe, there's a, there's a brand new one there. Um, and I have not been there yet. It's supposed to be fantastic. Oh, great. That's right. So, it's not open to the public, yeah. unfortunately. Yeah, okay. I'm sorry about that. Yes, no, I mean, I. Um, the old museum, yeah, the new one's supposed to be fabulous. And, uh, but yeah, but so a lot of people have asked me about that. You can't, can't get into it. It's not open to the public. Maybe it should be. Thank you all very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, sir. What great principles based on some wide experience, lots of good learning and experience. I like the uh, standards part about there it. Go. It is about high performing team. Uh, I'd like to present to you on behalf of Corps Cadets, the superintendent and the staff and faculty, this small gift to continue to guide you on your leadership right. journey and that'll give you true asthma. Thank you so much. So, Appreciate thank it, you sir. Very thank much. you. Let's give him another round. Thank you. That was great. Thanks.